going to share a little bit this evening, and I'm looking forward to it because I'm going to talk about the cross, and I'm going to share a few things that I've been discovering about the cross. And if you're not used to church, you don't come to church very often, that, that might sound a little bit dry. Um, but actually, what we're going to be talking about is the heart of what it is to have relationship with God. Really, it's the central thing uh, about, about, that gives us peace and gives us security when we come to know God and to be in a relationship with God. And a little while ago, I was helping out at a hospital, being uh, like when I was training uh, to be a vicar, and I had to go around and talk to people on the wards. And I remember having this conversation with this elderly lady called Margaret. And I'm sitting there talking to Margaret, and Margaret's just chatting away about her life, and she tells me about her husband and the fact they've been married for 50 years, and uh, they're both still going, but she's obviously not very well. And she says that they live in this high-rise tower block, and they don't get out much, and they, they never had kids, and so not many, not many people visit them. Occasionally, they get a visit from a district nurse, and she paints this picture of her life, and she says that she's been a churchgoer all her life, every week until she got too old and too frail, and then she started watching songs of praise, at which point I really felt sorry for her. And that's her church. And, and then, uh, you know, we had a nice little chat. It was quite sweet. And then I got up, and I was le- just as I was getting up to leave, she grabbed me by the arm, and she said what I suspect she'd wanted to say the whole time. She just hadn't had the courage. You know how if you're driving somewhere with someone, sometimes um, it's just as you arrive at your destination, you're getting out of the car that they come up with what they've been wanting to say for the last two-hour journey. It felt like that. She grabs my arm, and she looks at me, and she's elderly, and she's frail, and she looks scared, and she's wearing this kind of those hospital gown things they put you in. And she just said to me, Andy, sometimes I wonder whether... I've done something. And what she meant by that was she felt like she was about to meet her maker. She felt like she was going to come face to face with God very soon. And she wasn't sure that he wanted to meet her. She, she was fearful of seeing him because she felt like she'd done something, something to hurt God or something to offend God or something that would mean that when God met Margaret in, in the flesh, God would be like, go away, Margaret, I don't want to know you. And I remember thinking in that, at that moment, oh my word, Margaret, you've been going to church your whole life. Week in, week out, you've been watching songs of praise. And you still don't get it. You, st- you still don't understand the, the, the central message of Christianity, the message of the cross. And I remember mumbling something to her that wasn't very articulate and wasn't very good and then wandering away. And for, for, for months afterwards, thinking about Margaret and thinking about the fact that she was lying there wondering whether she'd done something and vowing to myself that if I ever had the chance to see her again, I would try and say in, in another way and in a different way, the message of the gospel, the word gospel means good news. And so in a sense this evening, this talk, if there was a title for it, it would be what I wish I'd said to Margaret that time. <laughs> but the reason it's relevant for us is because actually loads of us have something of what Margaret has. We carry it around inside of us, this, this fear that maybe we've done something to offend God. Even those of us who've been following Jesus for a long time can feel like that. And what that looks like in your life, the way it manifests itself, is that you feel insecure around God. You're not totally confident that he really wants to see you. The first thing you often say to God is sorry, or or, or you're afraid that if you've had a bad day or a bad week or you've messed it up again, that he won't want to know you. And uh, so this is trying to address that. And the place that we start is understanding that Christianity is not good advice It's good news. And there's a massive difference between those two things. Think about it like this. Um, Let's say that you sat an exam in January, which I'm sure some of us did, and you failed, which I hope you didn't. But, you know, when you fail an exam, you have to do a reset, don't you? And imagine that you do that, and you're in a situation where you're having to study for a reset. I'm sure quite a few of us, who's studying for an exam that's got coming up? Maybe not a reset, but an exam coming up this summer. Loads of us are. And when you're in a situation like that, what you need is good advice on how to maybe pass it when you didn't pass it the first time, good advice on how to revise when your revision the first time just involved having a textbook near you while you did everything else that you were doing. And fortunately, the internet is full of very good advice on how to revise. So I have this evening, given the exams are on the horizon, some study tips for us. You may want to write some of these down. These are fresh off the internet. Study tip number one, laminate your notes so that the tears roll off them. (laughs) 
study tip number two. Buy a stress reduction kit. And I have a photo of something that the internet sells you. <laughs> Buy one of these. Apparently, you just put it on a firm surface and do what it says in the circle until you feel better about life. Study tip number three. During exams, make creative use of animals. And I have found some pioneers of this technique. You might not be convinced, but look at this. This is uh, somebody's test, and they have drawn a little picture of a giraffe, which is saying hello, which is a very nice touch. And it says next to the giraffe, if I made any mistakes on this test, perhaps this picture of a giraffe will help convince you otherwise. And it has worked. They got a plus mark for that giraffe. Uh, other people incorporate animals actually into their answers. So here's another uh, picture of someone else who did this. There's a question, and the question is, a three kilogram object is released from a height of five meters on a smooth frictionless lamp ramp. Does it continue to move after it comes to rest? The person, as you can see, has drawn a picture of an elephant on the ramp and written, no, there is an elephant in the way. <laughs> What some people do with their animals is they just use them as emotionally manipulative tools. And so you can see another one here. This person has drawn a picture of a panda, and they have written next to the panda, the panda will cry if I get a bad grade. Brackets, just keep that in mind. Do it for the panda. And in that case, it didn't work. The teacher has just written, boo-hoo, cheer him up by studying for your finals. If none of those study tips work, study tip number four, and this is a guaranteed success, stand up, stretch, take a walk, go to the airport, get on a plane, <laughs> never return. <laughs> so, hopefully you made some notes there. Uh, that is, maybe it's not good advice, but it's advice of a fashion. And what many of us can think is, you know, if you, you're in that situation, let's say you've got a reset, and you're in there, in the library, cramming for this exam that you've got coming up. You follow the good advice, you're practicing your animal drawings, and then one of your mates finds out, they're walking past the staff room, and they happen to overhear that your first exam, the one that you thought you'd failed, you had in fact passed. They hear that you get an A. If you're in a scenario like that, there in the library, what you need is not advice on how to study, you need the news. You need your friend to grab that exam result and they come screaming into the library, running down the corridor, being like, you passed, you passed, it's okay, you don't need to do this all over again. You've, you've done it. And we're in a situation as followers of Jesus where what we have is not good advice, it's good news. And one of the main differences between Christianity and every other major world religion, this blew my mind when I found out, was that every other major religion, what it does is it gives you advice on how to get right with God. Live like this and do this and maybe you'll earn some sort of relationship with God. And what Christianity does is it says, no, it's been done for you. It's a piece of news. So whenever we share what we would call sharing our faith with other people, what we're doing is not giving them tips on how to live better. And like, if you do this, your life will improve. Although that is the case when you become a Christian. What we're saying is, no, no, this has already happened for you. All you've got to do is just hear it, discover it and receive it. It's good news. And at the heart of the message... That, that kind of the key part of the good news is what happens on the cross. And that's why Jesus talks about the cross quite a bit. So we've been singing some songs about the cross. I don't know if you've noticed when you've read the story of Jesus, you probably picked up the fact that he talks about it a lot. So here's a few examples. Um, this is from Mark's Gospel. If you have a Bible, why don't you open with me to Mark's Gospel? We're going to be in chapter 8 and chapter 9 and chapter 10. We're just going to hop around. But Mark chapter 8. Jesus is, um, takes the disciples to one side, and we read this in Mark 8, verse 31. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him which was a bad move, but that's another story. Then later, Mark chapter 9, the same thing happens. Jesus talks again about the cross. He says, the son of man, that's him, is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it, maybe because Peter got told off the first time. And then Mark chapter 10, third time, Jesus says, and this time he's going into even more detail. We are going up to Jerusalem, he said, 
And the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. And there's some strong stuff he says in there. So one of the key words that he's using is that this must happen. Must, big word, necessary, it's going to, it has to happen. And I can imagine, you know, you could probably can, if I was one of his disciples, that would, that would be a shock to you, wouldn't it? So you've had, you're having a great time. You've just been, you used to fish, and now you just wander around Galilee with Jesus, and you see him do these miracles, you see him raise people from the dead, you see him kind of turn uh, water into wine, or, 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 or feed 5,000 people with a little picnic, and you think this is, the, this is the bomb. And then he takes you to one side, and he starts saying all this stuff about how these people are going to kill me. They're going to take me. It's got to happen. I'm going to die. You know, he takes you to one side. Everybody else is over. He sits you down. He says, I am going to be killed. It has to happen. And here's how it's going to happen. They're going to spit on me. They're going to mock me. And ultimately, they're going to put me to death. Now, one of my questions, if I was, you know, having that conversation with Jesus, maybe one of yours too, would be, why? Why does that have to happen? And that's a question that loads of us have about the cross. Even those of us who've been following Jesus for a while, we sometimes, sometimes find ourselves asking, why is the cross necessary? Maybe if you shared the good news with a friend or something like that, and, they, and they've said, what's Christianity all about? And you said, well, Jesus dies on a cross so that we get forgiven. They might have come back with a question, why does he need to die for us to be forgiven? If, Jesus is, if God is so loving, why doesn't he just forgive us? Why is the cross necessary? And that's a question I suppose I want to try and answer in the next few minutes. Why is the cross necessary? And it's necessary for a number of reasons. Reason number one, why the cross is necessary. Because real forgiveness is costly. So think about it like this. I drive a top-of-the-range, second-hand Ford Focus. That's right. There is 100,000 miles on the clock. It smells like vomit because I have two kids. And it's pretty smooth. So let's say I'm driving my top of the range full focus just down the estate down here. And, uh, you know, I'm just driving along. And then you come in in your minibus or whatever you've come in. And you just smash into the side of my car just as I'm driving off. And it's obviously your fault. And I get out of the car. I'm pretty annoyed because you've just smashed into it. I realize that you've come from the celebration. And so I can't tell you what I'm really thinking. So we have a conversation. At the end of which, we probably work out it's going to cost about 500 quid to get this car mended. But I just say to you, hey, don't worry about it. It's fine, I forgive you. You get back in the minibus and drive home. Meanwhile, I call the RAC and get them down to my car and it gets taken to the mechanic and on Monday morning I get a bill for 500 pounds. Now what's happened there is when I've said, hey, there's 500 pounds here, you don't worry about it. What that means is not that the 500 pounds has just disappeared into the air, that it, you know, the car gets mended. What it means is I've said, I'll worry about it. You don't worry about that debt, but not because it's just not going to matter now, because somebody's got to pay it. And the option is either you pay it or I pay it. But me saying, I forgive you, don't worry about it, doesn't make the debt just disappear. What it means is I'm 500 pounds short. And we understand that when it comes to money, but most of our hurt when it comes to stuff that, that gets done to us or we do to other people, most of it isn't to do with money. Most of it's to do with relationships. But think about it in the same way. When someone hurts us, it's like they, they smash into our car, as it were, and they cause damage. And we say to that person, hey, don't worry about it. I forgive you. That debt doesn't just disappear. Either they pay it or we pay it, but someone's got to pay it. And so if, we say, if, we, if for example, we say they're going to pay it, what that is called is revenge. And so we say to them, hey, don't worry about it. And they say, are you sure? Are we good? And you say, oh, we're good. <laughs> are we fine? Oh, we're fine. You know, but you know that it's not fine and you're going to find a way to make them pay. And the problem with that, trying to make them pay, is it doesn't actually work because we just end up getting angry. We just end up getting bitter. Every time we see them, all those feelings come back up. But that's one way, trying to make them pay for the hurt that they did to us. The second thing you can do is you can pay for that hurt. And that's not called revenge, that's called forgiveness. 
but there's a cost to it. So let's say that someone humiliates us or, or you know, they, they embarrass us or they hurt us in some way. And then what we, what we do, if we forgive, is we choose, rather than getting our own back on them, we swallow it. So have you ever been in a situation where someone is a complete moron and, you know, you just, you, they've just absolutely done you in and you could just really unload on them if you wanted to publicly. You could humiliate them on Twitter. You could do whatever you want. You could really, like, have a massive go and you've got the ammo. Like, you know the stories. And you decide in that moment to not do it, even though they've hurt you. decide to swallow it. Anyone ever done that? None. None of us. We just unload. All right. But... but <laughs> We probably do that most of the time. But let's say on those odd occasions where you do swallow it, what happens is it's agony. It's like, oh my word, I could just tell some stories about you. But you keep your mouth shut. It's kind of, there's a cost to it. It's almost like there's a dying to self that takes place. And you can have, you know, occasionally, and maybe this is just me, I fantasize about destroying these people who've hurt me, you know, and I have this imagination that I go off and sort of like publicly, I, you know, humiliate them. And then I choose, if you want to forgive, what you've got to do is even with those fantasies that you have about humiliating them, you choose not to go there. I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to do that. And you opt out. Even that is a kind of dying to self. But what happens is after you do that for a while and you, you swallow that and you refuse to retaliate and you refuse to respond in kind, then what happens is you grab gradually get to a place where you really are free and you really do forgive and it really actually is okay when you say we're all good but but it costs you to get to that place and the point is this nobody just forgives there's always a cost to forgiveness either we make them pay and that's not forgiveness or we pay but it costs us And what's happening on the cross is that God is forgiving us, but there's a cost to that. There's this kind of cosmic size cost to it. And Jesus is God the Son, so it's not that God is making someone else pay. He's absorbing it in a visible, cosmic way, bearing the things that we've done wrong, our selfishness, into himself. So that's the first reason why the cross has to happen. Secondly, what the cross does is it sets you free. This is the second reason why he goes there. And so Jesus himself, he gives a reason for it. In Mark, Mark chapter 10, verse 45, he says this. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, when we hear that word ransom, what loads of us think of is kidnap. That's what I think of. But back in the day when Jesus is talking, he's talking about slavery. He's talking about ransoming people from slavery. So he's, it's this idea that people are slaves, and if you pay a certain amount of money, they get set free. And he's applying that to his death on the cross. So he's saying, just hear this, as he dies on the cross, you get set free. He's giving his life as your ransom. And one question that some of us might have is, well, I don't feel like I'm a slave that needs to be set free. And I understand that, but what the Bible shows us is that we're all slaves to sin. And a few bits of evidence, like if you want to know if you're a slave to sin, this is some stuff that I've been discovering in the mirror, that that reveals that we are slaves to sin. Sign number one, that you're a slave to sin. You know something's wrong, and you do it anyway. And I'm not talking about like stuff that's a little bit naughty. It's like, shall I have two McFlurries this evening? I think I will, (laughs) you know? I'm so evil. Like, not that, like bad stuff, proper bad stuff, yeah, that's really going to damage people or damage us. We know it's wrong. We know we shouldn't go there. We do it anyway. Sometimes we just can't help it. It's a sign we're a slave. Another sign that we're a slave, we know something's destroying us, and in order to deal with the pain that that thing is causing in our lives, we go back for more of it. That's kind of an addiction. So you know porn is destroying you. You know, it's, cool, it's breaking you up in, inside, but in order to deal with the pain that it's causing, you go back for more of it. Uh, whatever else it might be, you know this thing's hurting you, but you can't get out of the cycle, so you just go deeper and deeper into the rabbit hole. Third sign that we're a slave to sin is the fact that whatever we put in place of God ends up trapping us in some way. And so I used to think that the way it worked is you either worship God or you worship nothing. You're free. And it doesn't work like that at all. You either worship God or you worship something else. And whatever else we worship, that thing ends up owning you. It ends up destroying you. So if you make the supreme thing in your life, for example, being good looking, then what happens is after, if you're having a great hair day, you're fine. 
But if you're having a bad hair day, what happens is you wander around with this insecurity all the time. If you make the supreme thing being successful, then that's great so long as you succeed. But if you compare yourself to someone else who's more successful, then your identity begins to crumble. If you fail, you'll be crippled by that. You, you know, you'll be crippled by that. If you make the supreme thing in your life a relationship, then what happens is that's fine as long as the relationship's going well. But if the relationship ends, then it's as if you do. And so these things, what they do is they have a power over our lives. And we have a problem with that. We're trapped by that stuff. What we need in a situation like that is not good advice. The good advice is, okay, you've got an issue. You do stuff wrong. What every other major religion tells you to do is try harder. Try harder. Try not to do bad things. Try to be good. And what we do sometimes, even as followers of Jesus, and I've done this for too many years, is we make Christianity about trying harder too. We try and find a way to avoid the need for a savior by being our own savior. Think about it like this. There's two ways to avoid the dentist. And we all want to know what those are. Way number one to avoid the dentist is to say, stuff it. I don't care about my teeth. I'm going to eat all the Haribo I can get my hands on. And they can just rot. And then I'll buy some more on eBay. (laughs) The second way to avoid the dentist is this. I am going to take such good care of my teeth I'm going to floss every day. I'm going to eat an apple a day. I'm going to make sure no plaque or whatever that stuff is builds up there. I'm going to use all the different types of toothpaste they recommend. And then I'll never have to go. There's two ways to avoid the need for a savior. The first one is stuff it. I'm going to break all the rules. I don't care. The second is I'm going to keep them all. I'm going to try super hard. And then I'll never need to depend on him. Because I can do this. I can be good. I can make it. The problem with that second one is it doesn't work. And you end up a slave anyway. And what can happen is if that's our understanding of what Christianity is, be good so God will love you. If that's like the basis of it, and it has been for me for for quite a while, until God began to unpick it, if that's the basis of it, then what happens is no matter how hard you try, And no matter how well you do, you will find yourself at a point in life, whether it's a dark moment or it's a good one, whether it's in the beginning, the middle, or the end, wondering whether you've done something, wondering whether he really is going to accept you, wondering whether he really is going to welcome you home. And so if I could have that conversation with Margaret all over again, what I'd say is, have you done something, Margaret? Oh, my word. Flip, yes, you've done some stuff, Margaret. Let's get a whiteboard out. Like, let's list them. You've said that, Margaret. You did that. Oh, my word, Margaret, that's horrendous. You know, and we'd make a list right there in the hospital room. And then we'd get my own whiteboard out, and we'd make a list 10 times longer than Margaret's. And then what we'd say is, hey, Margaret, we've both done a whole load of stuff, haven't we? We've done something. Yeah, more than one thing. Let's list them. And then what we'd do is we'd wipe off the whiteboard, hers and mine, and we'd write a single word over it, ransomed. His life for yours, Margaret. He gave it for you. So you don't need to, it's not that you just do anything you want now, but the basis of any any closeness, any relationship of love, any peace that you have with God comes from what he's achieved for you. All we're doing is receiving that and living out of it. I was talking to Mike about the cross and I finished with this uh, a little while ago. And I was saying to him, man, the cross is hard to understand sometimes. I, I don't know how to explain it. And he said, oh, well, here's, here's an illustration that I have. He says it's a bit naff, but I, I, this is sometimes how I've tried to explain the cross. And I actually really liked it, so I'll finish with it. He says this, uh, imagine that Jesus one day wants to buy his father a present. And so he goes to the cosmic Asda. And he's wandering around the cosmic Asda, trying to think, what would my father love? And he sees on this shelf, kind of towards the back, a a Sarah. And he thinks, wow, wow, my father's going to love Sarah. Okay, I'll put her in the trolley. 
And then he wanders around and he sees like a, a Jacob or something. He thinks, wow, Dad's going to love Jacob. All right, I'll get one of Jacob's. Puts it in the trolley. And then Mike carried on telling me the story. And he says he wanders into the next aisle and he sees Mike's there. And he thinks, wow, I'm going to get five Mike's. You know, so he puts Mike in the trolley. Of course, I realize as Mike's telling that story that the only way you can buy Mike is in bulk. So he puts them all in. <laughs> Now this trolley weighs a ton, but Jesus is strong. So he's kind of like pushing the trolley up the aisle. And he gets there, finally gets to the checkout. And they're, 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 they're kind of scanning the, you know, they're like, wow, this is a lot of shopping. They scan the Sarah and put it in the basket, scan, scan the Jacob, scan all the mics, put them in the basket. And then, um, and then the lady says, this is going to be very expensive, Mr. Christ. This is really going to cost you a lot. And, uh, you know, Jesus is like, well, I know that. And then she opens up the checkout till the counter. And in order to pay, what Jesus does is he climbs in himself. He gets right in that till himself. And then there comes a day where you're standing face to face. And Jesus is there and he says to the Father, I've got something, Dad, for you. You are going to love it. You know? And then he says, here's Sarah. And the Father says, wow, that's amazing. Just what I wanted. Here's Jacob. Wow. That is amazing. Just what I wanted. Here's Mike. Did you get a gift receipt? Uh, sorry, I didn't mean that. And that's kind of taken the punch out of the illustration. But the point is, wow, oh my word. Here's Andy. Here's, here's whoever. Put your name in. That's how, it, that's how it works. And so the point I'm making is this. That, that when, so long as we think it's about what we do, and our attention is focused on whether we've done something... We'll always be insecure with the Lord. We'll always be full of guilt. We'll always never be sure that what he's going to do is welcome us with open arms. But when we understand the cross, what we come to understand is that it's not about what we do. It's about what he has done. And so anytime I come to the Father, I know that he's going to be like, wow, Andy, come on in. Welcome. Let's talk. Let's be together. Let's be friends. Not just now, not just in this moment, but forever and ever and ever and ever. He loves you. He knew it would cost him, and he paid that price anyway because you are just what he wants.